Good afternoon, everyone. We're in the book of Malachi, so would you turn to Malachi chapter 2, book of Malachi, the prophet Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, chapter 2, and our reading today is going to be from verses 1 to 9, which we're not going to read right now, but we'll read that in two parts as we come to our two main points today. And if you wanted a heading, today is God's judgment against the priests, God's judgment against the priests. So we're busy with the second oracle through these messenger Malachi, God's messenger Malachi, to Israel. And this one, as we said last week, runs from chapter 1, verse 6, through to chapter 2 and verse 9. And you may have noted last week that we didn't actually deal with verse 14 uh, in our first study. Uh, in, and this will come up again in chapter 3 when we deal with the subject of tithes and offerings. So I've not forgotten that verse 14, although we even refer to it today. Now, as we noted last week, this oracle is a charge directed primarily at the priest, the book of Malachi. Where is my honor? The simple honor due to a father from his children and from a servant to his master. God said not only does he not get this basic honor, but in fact the priests, as we observed last week, despise his name. We noted that God would rather they do not bring their sacrifices, that they would not light the useless fires, that they would shut their doors. And God says, I won't accept offerings, lame and blind and sick animals from your hand. And then we looked at drawing from these negative things, the sins of the priests, uh, positive, five positive principles of worship that can be applied and, and we had the five points. Worship to God is only acceptable when God is honored and feared. And they were doing the opposite. When we worship as he is prescribed, and it was so clear, and yet they would not just accept blind and lame and plundered and uh, uh, sick animals, but they would offer them on God's table. And there at God's table, and on the sacrifices at the table, they would sneer at them. And uh, we give him the glory that is due to his name was the third point. Now service to him is a sacrifice of praise. And you remember the priest, oh, how wearisome, how tiresome these offerings that they scoffed at them. And we can only worship God acceptably when we have a perfect priest. And we spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ where is the first part of this oracle in chapter 1, 6 to 14, was directed primarily to priests, clearly applied in parts to all the Israelites living in Jerusalem. In fact, in the bringing of those lame and sick and blind animals to the Lord's table, that was the work of the people and a reflection of the condition of their hearts. They were guilty like the priests of despising the Lord by bringing this kind of livestock to his table. They too were not showing God the honor due to him as his children and even as a servant to their master. In fact, that verse 14 we just referred to uh, was an indictment against the people. It says, Cursed is the cheat who as a male in his flock vows it and, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. My name will be feared among the nations. So the priests and the people together were to blame for these sins. But the greater sins were clearly the priests who were violating the covenant of Levi. As we'll see today, they were supposed to be teachers of the people. They were the ones who were supposed to guard knowledge, protect the Lord's honor in his house, and come with prescribed worship as recorded in the law of God, the five books of Moses. Yet they were the very ones turning aside, accepting to the Lord's table unacceptable offerings, and then scoffing at them. But you say, what a weariness this is. You snorted it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, who is lame and sick, and you bring this as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand? Then we get today to the second part of this message, verses 1 to 9. This one is directed clearly to the priests. 
Besides the prophets and the kings of the Old Testament, the priests were divinely appointed leaders of the people. Those charged with the work of God in the temple, the offerings, the sacrificing, sacrifices, guarding the house of the Lord. Those charged with living exemplary lives before God. It is to these that the messenger of the Lord brings threatening judgment to, uh, threatening judgment uh, from God in our verses today. You may remember in Exodus 28, when God was instructing Moses to make garments for the priests. This is what he wrote. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things of the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be acceptable before the Lord. The priests were mediators between God and his people. So if they were corrupt... If they sinned and turned aside, the nation clearly would be in serious trouble. That's why the New Testament, James tells us, James chapter 1, 3 and verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And certainly this was the case with the priests. As I said, we have only two main points today. We'll spend most of our time on the second that has four sub-points. So the first point we have, the call to repent and the certain judgment for failure to repent. The call to repent and the certain judgment for the failure to repent. We're going to read here verses 1 through 4 of our chapter 2. Then we're going to jump down to verse 8 and 9. So Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offering. Spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings. You shall be taken away with it. So that you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. And then down to verse 8 and 9, he continues this rebuke. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased Before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in instruction. This is God's word. The indictment was already laid in chapter 1, where God said, Where is my honor? Where is my fear? You despise my name. You pollute my table. You bring blemish sacrifices. You say what a weariness it is, and you snort at them. These priests have indeed turned aside from the way. Instead of honoring God and fearing him and loving him by their actions and by their hearts, they despise God. And you can go back to Nehemiah chapter 1. This judgment that God is bringing is a long time coming. In fact, in Nehemiah in that chapter 9, we don't have time to go through it. But he goes through from the earliest days of the exodus out of Egypt right up to the present time. The priests despised. The people turned away from the Lord their God. So it should be no surprise or think, wow, this is harsh to the people of Malachi at this time and in this place. The Lord is angry. And even as he, even as he commands repentance, the words of certain judgment for failure to listen follows right on the heels of these words. Failure to take this command to repent to heart will certainly result in a curse upon the priest. In fact, it's already on the way. God, as he speaks, has already put it in motion because he says you will not take it to heart. 
You haven't done so for a thousand years and you will not take it to heart. God will now despise them. He will humiliate them and bring even greater poverty upon them. And that was part of their complaint against God that he had forsaken them, that he was not blessing them even as they were bringing sacrifices. And the blessings they pronounce as priests, God has already turned these into curses. The offspring of these sacrifices are cursed. The flocks and the herds will be no more. The Lord is going to cut off all prosperity from them. They will be disgraced. And those who look upon these wicked priests will see a disgusting picture. The dung from these despicable sacrifices will be spread on their faces because you have turned aside from the way. Instead of a clear path of instruction, they have caused many to stumble. The priests who were supposed to guard the temple, to, to consecrate the sacrifices, to, to sacrifice in the way that God had ordained, were the ones causing the people to stumble. They have violated the covenant of Levi. Everything the holy priesthood was designed for had been violated by the priests. Yet we read a wonderful thing here, that the Lord will not, Lord will not forsake his covenant, but he will remove the wicked priest. He will wipe out the priests. They will be taken where the dung and the refuse from the temple sacrifices gets taken outside of the city to be burnt. God does this because he is a covenant-keeping God to protect his covenant. Verse 4, so shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. His covenant with Levi will stand. God will preserve it. And as we observed last week, because God has given us a perfect priest, even our prophet, priest, and king, the Lord Jesus Christ, his purposes will stand. From the rising of the sun to the setting, my name will be great among the nations. In every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For now my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. The judgment to the priests. Secondly, we have what is a true priest? What is a true priest? Here we're going to read verses 5 to 7 together. Malachi chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. And I entered at this last week that we will look more at the true priest this week. And here it is, verse 5. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me, and he stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found at his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity as opposed to making them stumble. Verse 7, for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. People should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. We have in these verses not only what the Levitical priest should have looked like, the characteristics of a true priest, but we, as we noted last week, we cannot worship God unacceptably unless we have a perfect priest. This, so this passage is prophetic in a sense, describing to us our perfect priest. The perfect priest, greater even than that of Aaron and the Levites. We have here a heavenly priesthood. After the order of Melchizedek, that mysterious priesthood that Abraham encountered in Genesis 14, referred to again in Psalm 110 and in various places in the book of Hebrews. Psalm 110, verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And you can read in Hebrews 7 various passages. I'll just read verse 23 to you. 
The former priests were many in number because they prevented, were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So in these verses in Malachi, we have what the priests were supposed to look like. We have the perfection of our Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. We have what a true minister of the gospel should look like. Brothers and sisters, we have what every transformed life in the Lord Jesus Christ should look like, the children of God. For we too are a royal priesthood. As First Peter 2 verse 9 says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So don't just think of the priests back then. Don't just think of, and certainly we must think of the Lord Jesus Christ, our perfect priest. Don't just think of ministers of the gospel today. This is what they ought to be like. And elders, we're watching you. But we are a royal priesthood, and there's application for every single one of us today. What does a priest look like? Well, a true priest, first of all, to be conformed to the covenant of God made with the tribe of Levi, who were the priests to serve in the tabernacles and the temple. And though there is no record of the actual covenant, and you could look back in the Old Testament, there's no record of the actual covenant made with Levi. It's clear throughout the Old Testament, Genesis, right here through Malachi, that the tribe of Levi were called by God and appointed by him as priests, and that God had a covenant with them. Here in our text, these three verses uh, packed in here, we have what the covenant of Levi and what a true priest should, in fact, look like. And four things from our text today. And the first thing is a priest was in, in a covenant relationship with God. And this one's kind of obvious, but important to say. A true priest was called by God. He was appointed by God. He was from the tribe of Levi. He was in a covenant relationship with God. Verse 5, look at it. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. Now, friends, the priesthood wasn't a casual employee. You went to the temple, you kind of liked what was happening there, and so you enrolled and you studied under a priest, and there you go, your career choice was made, and you could resign when you got a little tired of it and move on to the next job. No, a priest was chosen, he was called, he was appointed by God, and he was bound in covenant. He was bound in covenant. This covenant relationship constituted a proper relationship with God. It was a covenant of life and peace, and God gave it to them. As obedience to the old covenants guaranteed life, peace, and prosperity, so the new covenant in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ guarantees us peace with God and eternal life. And we as believers are in covenant with our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and verse 1, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a covenant of peace. And the blood of the new covenant is a covenant of peace and life. John 3, 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on heaven. Life and peace is given by God in his covenant. And then the priest's covenant responsibility. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. And from our study last week, worship to God is only acceptable when God is honored and feared. James Montgomery Boyce notes here, and I quote, Most people are aware that the word fear, often used in translations of the Old Testament text, 
actually means reverence. So when the psalmist writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, in Psalm 110, he's actually saying that true knowledge begins with a reverential awe of God. All things spiritual begins with such reverence, and God's ministers need to cultivate it more than anything else. And all God's people need to cultivate this more than anything else. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. It was a covenant of reverential awe towards God and his name. And my friends, this was the one thing that would have changed everything in the book of Malachi. If they had given God the honor that was due to his name, if they had feared him, if they showed him reverential awe, they would never have despised him. They would never have neglected his word and his statutes, his commands regarding sacrifices. They would have continued in a covenant of life and peace, which is what God intended. And here's the most solid advice we can take for ourselves today. Here's the best application for our souls. And if we have everything, if we have this, everything else will fall into place. Fear God. Honor his name. Give him reverential awe. Stand in awe of his name. We are in covenant with him. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Second thing about a true priest. Secondly, a true priest has a personal commitment to the truth of God's word. A true priest has a personal commitment to the truth of God's word. The first part of sex, look at, look at it there. It says, true instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. The duty of the ministers of God's word is to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This, my friends, would be an impossible task were it not for the inspired and fallible word of God which is the preacher's duty to proclaim. If we were left to ourselves, most of our words would be error, or at best would be error mixed with a little bit of truth. But when we proclaim God's word, we proclaim what is eternally truthful, not only for a particular moment of history, for a particular person, but true for all time and for all people. Proclaim God's word is a great responsibility. These priests were charged with causing men to stumble because they turned aside from the way. They neglected the truth of the word of God. How much greater was their responsibility because the great characteristic of a priest was that true instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. We can think of the New Testament, Paul's instruction to that young Timothy who was going to take over to him, the sub-apostle, if you like. Listen to what he says in 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words. That was not your own ideas. The pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, God, the good deposit entrusted to you. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And 2 Timothy 3.16, so well known to us, all scripture is God-breathed out, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. A true priest had a personal commitment to the truth of God's word. Thirdly, our third point, a true priest will exhibit a godly character and true piety. This is from James Montgomery Boyce's commentary. 
A true priest will exhibit a godly character and true piety. That's the second part of verse 6 of our text. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. In other words, in the words of Micah 6, 8, he was a man who humbly walked with God. His life will be fashioned after God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The dictionary defines piety as reverence for God or devout fulfillment of religious obligations. True piety, the essential requirement here is godliness, to mimic God. To be conformed in the New Testament uh, language to the image of his son. To walk in peace and uprightness. And so doing, turn many away from iniquity. We want to be effective in our witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives must match our profession. Otherwise people will not hear. If we want to be effective in our witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, our lives, what we do from Monday to Saturday, must match our profession. Teaching of the epistles is filled with exhortations to godliness for all believers, and especially those who are ministers of the gospel. 1 Timothy 6.11, he writes to Timothy again, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And 2 Peter 3 and ver- 2 and verse 3, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Brothers and sisters, the greatest prayer you can pray for ministers of the gospel, for your pastors, is not that we become great preachers or that we become successful as the world defines the term, but pray that we will be faithful to the teachings of God's word and that we would be godly. Pray that we would be faithful to the teaching of God's word and that we would be godly. If you pray that for me every day of your life, I'd be greatly indebted to you and for each other. Brothers and sisters, how many have made a shipwreck of their faith? And my guess is the greatest cause, whether minister or member, is our lack of godliness is when we allow sin to take a hold of us, when we buckle to Satan's devices and succumb to personal pleasure and selfishness and pride, when we do not watch our doctrine closely, when we forget to honor and fear and revere God and stand in awe of his name. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Fourthly and finally, a true priest will preserve knowledge. A true priest will preserve knowledge. From our text in verse 7, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and the people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. And Malachi is not talking here simply about the conveyance of knowledge, as if the preacher were to be merely a storehouse of details about Hebrews kings and the background of the New Testament and fine points of theology or quotations from great uh, church history, great men in church history. Malachi is talking about a knowledge of God, which is salvation. John 17 verse 3 And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. A true priest's lip should guard knowledge about the way to live a God-pleasing life. This is the instruction that the people should receive from the minister of the gospel, the true messenger of the Lord of hosts. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel 
The godly minister passes this on. The sheep look to him for instruction and are fed. Listen to Martin Luther. Uh, It's a rather long quote on this text. He stresses how important it is to do this through preaching. And I quote, Certainly God could win, could with his spirit uh, instruct and justify those whom he would, but it has pleased his wisdom more to instruct, justify those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. The word is the channel through which the Holy Spirit is given. This is a passage against those who hold the spoken word in contempt. Unless the word is preached publicly, it slips away. The more it is preached, the more firmly it is retained. Reading is not as profitable as hearing it, for the live voice teaches, exhorts, defends, and resists the spirit of error. Satan does not care a hoot about the written word of God, but he flees at the speaking of the word. The Sermon on the Mount is a great example. This penetrates hearts and leads back those who are astray. My friends, preaching is the pattern in the Old Testament. Preaching is the pattern in the New. John the Baptist came preaching. Jesus came preaching. The apostles came preaching. For God has ordained that the preached word is what will make men wise unto salvation. Titus 1.3, and at the proper time manifest in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. Romans 10, 14, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe of him of whom they have not heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? May God give all ministers, may he make those that he has given us faithful to his word. May he give us all ears to hear what the Spirit says through them for the church's benefit. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, rebuke, reprove, exhort with complete patience and teaching. The true priest is the covenant relationship with God. Brothers and sisters, when we are in Christ, we are in a covenant relationship with God. A true priest has a personal commitment to the truth of God's word. Bind truth upon your hearts. Hide God's word in your heart that you would not sin against him. A true priest, a true child of God, has a personal commitment to the truth of God's word. A true priest exhibits personal godliness and holiness of life. Pastor Sam was talking about the law and the gospel, what God expects from us to obey the commands of Christ and to trust in Christ, who has fulfilled the whole law for us, who presents us perfectly before the Father. A true priest preserves knowledge. A true priest preserves knowledge. May the Lord write these things upon our hearts that we may be truly a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, exhibiting the characteristics of a true priest, as opposed to these priests in the book of Malachi. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how we bless you and thank you that all these things are only possible because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, a perfect priest who not only presents us to God perfectly, but who himself has become the sacrifice for our sins. How we thank you for life. How we thank you for prosperity. How we thank you for peace in the gospel, which is what you give us in your covenant of life and peace. Lord, our prayer is that as your people, each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, may be as those who love you, who stand in awe of your name, who honor you, who love your word, who preserve instruction and knowledge, 
who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Oh, Lord, we bless you. Our prayer is that we would walk before you in holiness, that your word would continue to be a lamp to our feet and a light and to our path. Oh, Lord, grant that we would love you more, that we would love your word more, and that we would walk with you in righteousness and in peace. For Christ's sake, amen.